Yeah, my name is Bob Bolger. I'm a deacon here at St. Paul of the Cross Church. In addition to that, I've been married for 40 years to my lovely wife, Kathy, who travels with me everywhere. And uh, delighted to be here this morning talking about the topic of salvation history and your role in it. And as I was thinking about how to get started on this discussion, I remembered a moment in my older daughter's life, my daughter Maureen's life. Uh, she was young, she was in her 20s, and she had just broken up with her first true love. You know, if you have kids that go through that first true love experience, you know how traumatic it is when they break up. And she was, needless to say, she was heartbroken. And I remember one night, uh, Kathy and I were sitting on our patio with our daughter, and we were kind of commiserating with her. And at one point I said to her, well, sweetheart, what are you searching for? And she looked at it, and in her innocence, she said, well, I want what you and mom have. And I thought for a moment, and as lovingly and as compassionately as I could, I said, but you can't have it. And what I meant by that was, she wasn't part of the history that had gotten us to that point in our lives. What I tried to explain to her was that she was seeing at that moment in time, she was seeing the result of some 20 years of work that we had put into this relationship. And what we had at that particular moment in time was not the result of some emotional pixie dust, um, but the result of many highs and lows, many joys and sorrows, uh, many hugs and tugs, <laughs> tears of happiness, tears of sorrow, moments of anger and passion and laughter and compromise. But underneath all of that was a simple promise, a commitment to love that we had made 20 some years before. And each day that we spent together, we made a conscious decision to honor that covenant that we made on our wedding day. To be faithful to one another, to be always present to one another, to be forgiving of one another, and to simply promise to work to stay in relationship with one another each and every day. And our daughter had not been part of that journey. And she could not have what we had until she went through that experience herself. And I, I share that story because I think it's a very frail human image of the divine design for each and every one of us for our salvation and how we're called to participate in that. Because from the beginning of the Bible to its very end, God is speaking to us about his desire to be in relationship with us. We have a God who wants to be known to us. We have a God who loves us and wants us to love him back. Our need for salvation is not something that God does to us, but really what we do to ourselves. And our role in salvation history is to come to our senses and resolve to return to a relationship with God. So let me share with you maybe just some key points um, in our salvation story. Start at the beginning of the Bible. We are made in the image and likeness of God. From the very beginning of sacred scripture, in the first chapter of Genesis, as you all know, we learn that we are made by God for God. Then God said, let us make man in our image after our likeness. And God created man in his image. In the divine image he created him, male and female he created them. So we are told by God, scripture is the word of God, we're told by God that we are each created with a divine spark, an image and likeness of God. God wants to reside in us. He wants to be part of our being. And that creates in each one of us an inherent dignity and it bestows a sacredness on human life. At the offertory of the Mass, after the priest pours the wine into his chalice, he takes the little uh, um, flagon with a little bit of the water and he puts a few drops of water into the chalice. You've seen that thousands of times probably. Well, the wine obviously represents the divinity of Christ because it'll be changed into the precious blood. The water represents our simple human nature. But the priest mixes the water into the wine. 
And he says this prayer very silently. Deacons are blessed to be able to say this as well when we assist at the altar. It's a silent prayer. By the mystery of this water and wine, may we come to share in the divinity of Christ, who humbled himself to share in our humanity. It's the mingling of the humanity and the divinity in that very simple little ritual. God wants to share himself with us. He wants us to share also in his divinity. Second thought, we have been given the gift of free will. God desires a relationship with him, but he's given us this gift to either turn to him or to turn away from him. We can choose to make God the center of our lives, or we can choose to worship something other than God. God gave us this gift of free will, and it's been abused by man ever since the story of Adam and Eve in the Garden of Eden in Genesis. When Adam and Eve chose to eat the fruit, of the, the forbidden fruit, I should say, of the tree of knowledge, they turned away from God. And all of their offspring, the stories of the Old Testament, all of their offspring looked to replace that lost divine spark with things like wealth, pleasure, power, honor. And so our salvation history starts with man's fall. Our original sin is the result of our human weakness, our constant susceptibility to the tempter, the evil one, and results in our trying to make ourselves God or something different from God, something that we can possess, control, or manipulate. But God is God, and we are not, and nothing else is. God has to save us from ourselves. And that brings us to another point in our salvation history. The power of God is greater than the power of Satan. We all know that, but we got to say it, right? The power of God is greater than the power of Satan. <laughs> our salvation history, as it's spoken through the scriptures, reveals that Satan is vulnerable. Satan's power is not from God. It is the absence of God. Satan's power is vulnerable because it's not aligned with God. One last story about this idea. I was seven years old. I still remember it to this day, even though I'm a little older than seven now. I was seven years old, and I had had enough of my father's very strict rules in the house, and I decided I could make it on my own. Thank you very much. And uh, I packed up some clothes in a bag, and I left. And I got to the end of the block uh, the end of our street, and I remembered that I was hungry. So I went back home. Um, now, did my father know of my rebellion? <laughs> I suspect that he did. Was I still his son? Apparently so. There was still a place for me at the table for dinner. Now, suppose someone had asked my dad at that point, you know, Mr. Bolger, your son, he says, your son says he has no need of his father. Do you could still consider him your son? What do you think my dad would have said? He would have considered himself my father, and he would have considered me his son, even if I didn't consider him my father, and even if I didn't consider me his son. His commitment to me was greater than my commitment to him at that point. So it is with God. I can count on him to relentlessly pursue a relationship with me no matter what. That's the truth of our salvation history. Another aspect of our salvation history and our role in it. Relationships cannot be forced. Submitting to love in a selfless manner, that's the answer. Think for a moment about some of the best relationships you have in your life. They were created and nurtured over time, right? Constant decisions and actions have to demonstrate your commitment, and that creates a bond that grows stronger and stronger and stronger over time. True relationships are a choice, not an emotion. Human love, think about human love. Quite often, human love, or what we call love, is rooted in convenience our convenience. It suits the need of the person at the time and works into our schedule, our plan for our life, if you will. 
So human love is rooted in convenience. God's love is rooted in eternity. God's love is eternal. We're always on God's itinerary. Human love is emotional. God's love is committed. Now, does God have feelings for us? I, I suspect he does. God probably has feelings for us. But God's feelings do not dictate his love. His love is based on his decision to love us. And our actions don't increase or decrease his commitment to us. In fact, I believe that even if someone never loves God, God still loves that person. That has to be something we would believe, right? You cannot force someone to love you. You cannot exercise your will so that another person will enter into a mutual relationship with you. And for me, I think that's why Mary, the Blessed Mother, is really the model of our faith and the way we should aspire to relate to God. In our salvation history, Mary is the sinless Eve. Whereas Eve said no to God's gift, Mary was the woman of the great yes. Yes. She accepted the overture of God with humility and grace and gratitude. Behold, I am the handmaid servant, if you will. I am the handmaid of the Lord. May it be done to me according to your word. My soul proclaims the greatness of the Lord. My spirit rejoices in God my Savior. For he has looked upon his handmaid's lowliness. The mighty one has done great things for me. And holy is his name. All of those beautiful words taken from the first chapter of Luke. The New Testament is the fulfillment of the Old Testament covenant. Because of our consistently and constantly flawed human nature, man cannot save himself. Although we are made in that image and likeness of God, we are incapable of our own salvation. So the New Testament reveals that God sent his only son, Jesus, which, as you know, means God saves. God sent his only son, Jesus, to accomplish that redemptive act. The angel of the Lord appeared to Joseph in a dream and told him to name Mary's child Jesus because he will save his people from their sins. Matthew's Gospel, first chapter. Or as St. Paul writes in his beautiful letter to the Romans, chapter 10, verse 9, For if you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. When we adore God, we try to strengthen an intimate, personal relationship with our Lord and Savior, a fundamental part of our salvation history. One last idea, one last thought about our salvation history. Love for God does not preclude human suffering. It's so important. Love for God does not preclude human suffering. A large part, I think, of understanding salvation and our role in it is to understand that pain and suffering still exist. Our love for God, our relationship for God, our encounter with Him does not eliminate illness, depression, loneliness, or death. The question is never, why is God doing this? That's a question we can't answer. But rather the question should be, where is God in this? That we can answer. Where is God in our pain, in our suffering, in our dark times? God sent his son Jesus Christ to be in the midst of our pain and suffering and to conquer it once and for all time. Consider again Paul's beautiful letter to the Romans, this time chapter 8. What, shall, what then shall we say to this? If God is for us, who can be against us? He who did not spare his own son, but handed him over for us all, how will he not also give us everything else along with him? Through our suffering, we can draw others to Christ in us. In our suffering, I invite you to remember the faith of Mary, the Blessed Mother, 
So Mary held the baby in moments of great joy and happiness. Mary held the body in moments of great sorrow and suffering. She was the first and the last person to hold Christ. Think about that. She remained through all of that. She remained the woman of the great yes. No wonder Mary can intercede for us when we suffer. So, to kind of wrap it up, God has a plan for the salvation of all of us, and in particular, each one of us. God has created in us a holy longing to be in relationship with him. That's our path to salvation. He has spoken to us in the scriptures, and God's full revelation was made known to us in the person of Jesus Christ. Everything we need to know about God is contained in the revelation of Jesus Christ. It's taken us centuries, millennia, to try to continue to unfold it and unpack it. But think about that. God's full revelation to us is in his son, Jesus Christ. And just as God spoke to Elijah at Mount Horeb in that tiny whispering sound in the first book of Kings, God will continue to talk to us in that same way. And to understand him, to turn towards him, and to turn away from sin, we must come face to face with him, adoration, ad ora, and discern his plan for our redemption. No one else has our work to do. And our salvation is a process, not a single event, a process that culminates with eternal life. God asks that we be faithful to him and to ourselves. Quotation from Parker J. Palmer, who was actually a Quaker, but wrote some very, very inspirational and powerful reflections. This is from Parker Palmer. If we are unfaithful to our true self, we will extract a price from others. We will make promises we cannot keep, build houses from flimsy stuff, conjure dreams that devolve into nightmares, and other people will suffer if we are unfaithful to our true self. God knows our true self. God created our true self. God asks us to be faithful to our true self. Yet we are not perfect. We are not perfect because we all continue to be human. Because the darkness of evil continues to exist and Satan is relentless in attempting to turn us away from God so that we'll have moments of self-doubt and confusion. St. Francis had moments of doubt. Mother Teresa, like St. John of the Cross, had a lengthy dark night of the soul. Yet I think we must use those moments as a springboard for prayer rather than the final word of our salvation. We must complete the work that God has begun in us. Let me close with one last image for you to reflect on in your role in salvation history. At my beautiful and powerful diaconate ordination, after the cardinal had placed his hands on my head and ordained me, after that moment, that ritual in the ordination ceremony, you, each person goes up to the cardinal and he hands you a book of the Gospels. He's holding it, you're holding it at the same time. There's this connection between the cardinal and the deacon, and that connection is the book of the Gospels. And here's what we are told. Receive the gospel of Christ, whose herald you now are. Believe what you read. Teach what you believe. And practice what you teach. And I would offer the same exhortation for all of you. Embrace the sacred word of God in the Bible. Accept your role in salvation history. Believe what you read. Teach what you believe. And practice what you teach. And finally, let me close for you with these words from St. Paul to the Philippians in chapter 1. But I want to offer them not as words of sacred scripture, but as my prayer for each one of you. I give thanks to my God at every remembrance of you, praying always with joy in my every prayer for all of you, 
because of your partnership for the gospel from the first day until now. And I am confident in this, that the one who began a good work in you will continue to complete it until the day of Jesus Christ. Thank you and God bless you. Thank you.